Living in America as a black person, you recognize there is one set of laws for you and one set of laws for those, especially in the white community. In our book, Passive Aggressive Racism in the System of White Supremacy, I take you through times in my life when I first started noticing white supremacy. We teach you how to recognize it, identify it, and also counter it in our book. This book is a beginner's course for those that are just starting to wake up and open their eyes to see the system of white supremacy. As a black American person, you must understand this system because this system is life or death to you. How you handle it, how you deal with it, it can affect your mental health if you don't understand this system. Pick up our book, Pass Aggressive Racism and the System of White Supremacy today on Amazon. China says it has a zero tolerance policy for racism, but discrimination towards Africans goes back decades. A black version of the Chinese flag swept across African Twitter earlier this year as users replaced their avatars to express their anger at the government of China. They were outraged not only by the widespread reports of the coronavirus-related discrimination against Africans in China, but also by the claims on Chinese state media that the allegations were groundless rumors. An answer from Kenya tweeted, We expect the kind of hospitality we give to Chinese here in Africa be reciprocated in their home country. Another user in Kenya, Peter Kariuki, who wrote, we need a united Africa which will not be slaves of hashtag Black China. The southern city of Guangzhou has Asia's largest African population, while the exact number of Africans living in Guangzhou is unknown. In 2017, more than 320,000 Africans entered or left China through the city according to state news agency Xinhiao. At the state of the pandemic, many Africans were subject to forced coronavirus testing and arbitrary 14-day self-quarantine regardless of their recent history of travel and scores were left homeless after being evicted by landlords and rejected by hotels under the guise of various virus containment measures. The incident caused a rupture in China-Africa relations, with the foreign ministry of seven African nations and even the African Union demanding answers from China. Yet China's officials' response stopped short of admitting that the discrimination took place or apologizing for it. All foreigners are treated equally. We reject differential treatment and we have zero tolerance for discrimination, said Chinese Foreign Minister spokesman Zhao Lijian. Chinese embassy in South Africa said in a statement, there is no such thing as so-called discrimination against Africans in Guangdong province. The Global Times, a nationalist tabloid controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, went on step further, publishing an article titled who is behind the fake news of discrimination against Africans in China? Traditionally, Beijing has portrayed racism as a Western problem. But for many Africans whose countries have in recent years become heavily economically entwined with Beijing, the Guangzhou episode exposed the gap between the official diplomatic warmth Beijing offers African nations and the suspicion many Chinese people have for Africans themselves, and that has been a problem for decades. The West only began really noticing and criticizing China's relationship with Africa in 2006, following a landmark summit which saw nearly every African head of state descend on Beijing. Yet China's ties with Africa stretch back in the 1950s, when Beijing befriended newly independent states to position itself as a leader of the developing world and to counter US and USSR power during the Cold War era. Beijing talked up its shared history of oppression by white imperialists, 
condemned South Africa's apartheid early on and gave aid to Africa even when China was a poor country. In 1968, Beijing spent the equivalent of 3 billion US dollars in today's money on constructing the Tsamu Railway in Zambia and Tanzania, and in the 1960s it began offering Africans full scholarships to Chinese universities. The presence of African students in China was highly unusual. Most foreigners fled China after the Communist Party came to power in 1949. When African students began arriving in significant numbers in the late 1970s, China was just beginning to open up to the world. The vast majority of the people still lived in rural areas with no access to international media and had not seen black persons outside of propaganda posters, let alone meeting them. From the beginning, crashes were reported across the nation. In 1979, Africans in Shanghai were attacked by playing music too loudly leading to 19 foreigners being hospitalized after another fracas in 1986 this time in Beijing 200 African students marched through the capital shouting that Chinese claim of friendship were a mask of racism the Chinese deceived us Solomon A study of Liberia told the newspaper, "We know the truth now. We are going to tell our governments what the truth is." China's then education minister spokesman said, "It is the consistent and long-term policy of the Chinese government to oppose racism." In 1988, a total of 1,500. Of the 6000 foreign students in China were Africans and had been scattered to campuses around the country a tactic designed to dilute racial tension according to the 1994 report by Michael J Sullivan in China Quarterly magazine but the attempt didn't work and on Christmas Eve that year anti-black tension exploded in the eastern city of Nanjing resulting in a mob of Chinese protesters running the Africans out of town after the Chinese government claimed that African students had arrived at a campus dance armed with weapons including knife and beat up Chinese guards teachers and students after being asked to register their Chinese gates according to the Jiangsu Provincial Yearbook the Africans maintained that when they tried to bring a Chinese friend into the dance they were taunted with calls of black devil and a fight ensued whichever account is true what happened after that has been well documented Later that night about 1000 local students surrounded the African dormitories after rumors swept campus that they were holding a Chinese woman Agnes Hawil Chinese students lobbed bricks through their windows after police broke up the scene on Christmas day about 70 African students decided to flee the campus and went on foot to the city train station hoping to travel to Beijing where they had embassies Other dark skinned foreigners including Americans also fled fearing for their safety. On campus, rumors spread that the Chinese hostage had died. At 7 p.m. on Christmas Day, a mob of about 8000 students from universities across the city began marching to the rail station, carrying banners shouting severely, punishing the murderer and drive out black people. As the mob closed in, police bust out all the black students to a nearby guest house where they were held until several Ghanaians and Gambian students were arrested for the fight at the campus dance. The other Africans were bust back to campus and warned not to go out at night. Kaisa Ku An American born Chinese guitarist in the Tang Dynasty rock band and founder of the media group Sub China was studying at the Beijing University of Language and Culture that Christmas living on a dormitory floor with students from Zambia and Liberia he remembers hearing about the race riots they were angry 
with the Africans that apparently a Chinese woman Hona had been solid. He said, this is one of the things where the rumors just kept getting inflated. By the time it reached my ears, the version was that a Chinese girl had been raped to death when, of course, there was no evidence of anything like that ever happening. As far as I can tell, it was more like an African man had asked out a Chinese girl. The Nigerian event was not on outlier. In the city of Hangzhou, students claimed Africans were carriers of AIDS virus in 1988, even though foreign students had been tested negative for HIV before entering the country. Then in January 1989, about 2,000 Beijing students boycotted classes in protest against Africans dating Chinese women. In Wuhan that year, posters appeared around campuses calling Africans black devils and urging them to go back home. Core members, you know all around me, there was this real concern among the African students for this kind of rising xenophobia on the college campuses. That created a problem of Beijing as it undermined Chinese credentials as the leader of the developing world and the hostilities didn't go un unnoticed back home. Just as African media across the continent was outraged by the Guangzhou incident in April 2020, newspapers in Africa reacted with indignation in 1980s. A Kenyan publication said they were not accidental. A Liberian newspaper spoke of yellow discrimination. A Nigerian radio station said the Chinese student could not bear to see Africans mix with Chinese girls. The Chinese ambassador to the Organization of African Unit, the predecessor of the African Union, was called in to answer for what was happening in, in China. And the OAU Secretary General called it apathide in disguise. Many African students left China as a result. Around the same time, China announced a reduction in interest-free loans for Africa, making a cooling of official relations, although ties were never blocking. Now, a professor in social science at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Soutman, says that while the anti-African protests during the late 1980s were about race, they were also a way of Chinese students to express broader anti-government sentiments. The people who participated in anti-African demos then were university students, and those students were in the same way jealous of African students. The Africans typically got their own rooms, whereas Chinese were often living eight per dormitory. They perceived them as a living better than they did because they got subsidies from their home governments and the Chinese government. And they also bought and also thought that Africans acted in a, free, a freer way than Chinese students were allowed to act. As Chinese interactions with African people increased in the 21st century, the awkward gap between the public friendship Beijing extends and the private suspicions its citizens harbor has once again sparked movement and moment of racial tension. In 2009, an African Chinese contest on a Shanghai TV talent show received a barrage of internet abuse because of her skin color. In an opinion piece in a state-run Chinese dairy, columnist Raymond Zhu added that this discrimination statement from the fact that came from the fact that for thousands of years, those who worked outdoors had darker skins and were the low social status rather than racism. But more recent events have undermined the idea that discrimination against black people in China is not racism. In 2016, 
a Chinese detergent maker sparked international outrage over an advertisement that showed a black man being washed whiter in order to woo an Asian girl. A spokesperson for the company said Western media was being too sensitive. The following year, a museum in the city of Wuhan apologizes for presenting an exhibition that juxtaposed images of African people and world African animals making similar facial expressions. Then, in 2018, the annual gara for national broadcaster CCTV drew a year after a Chinese woman appeared in a black face. In Africa, where it is estimated more than one million Chinese people now live, there have been repeated reports of Chinese restaurant owners setting up establishments that ban Africans. There is classic discussions over whether Chinese racism is racist in the way it is envisioned in the West or Europe, or it is a different kind of discriminatory policy. Discrimination against Africans in China during the coronavirus pandemic has exposed that fact. Earlier this year, in a bid to head off those criticisms, officials in Guangdong announced new measures to combat racial discrimination, including setting up host hotlines for foreign nationals. The notice said that shops, hospitals, restaurants, and residents' communities that they should place places where Africans had been targeted should offer strictly should offer strictly equal services. But Paul Mensa, a Ghanaian trader who has been living in the southern Chinese city of Shenzhen for five years, says the treatment of Africans in China during the COVID-19 pandemic has shaped its perceptions of racial attitudes in the country. I thought racism was inherent in America, but I never thought people in China would do this, says Mensa. He added that before when Chinese people would see a black person, they would touch his skin and touch his hair. And I thought it was out of curiosity because a lot of them don't travel. But this is racism and there is no punishment for it. Southman, who wrote the paper on the Nanjing riot, says, that if China is serious about eliminating the maltreatment of foreigners, it should punish those who make out racial abuse and discrimination. Article 4 of China's constitution displays and stipulates that all ethnic groups in the People's Republic of China are equal. Discrimination and oppression of any ethnic group is prohibited. It is forbidden to undermine ethnic unity and create ethnic divisions. But there have been no reports of people in Guangzhou being held accountable for their actions against Africans. And the constitution has had little effect in protecting China's own ethnic minorities. It will be hard to change the way Chinese people treat Africans. There is no a place in the world where, where racial discrimination has been diminished without taking those actions. Well, the topic goes a long way. Let me leave it here for you, brothers and sisters, to contribute. My name is Osi the Bone Child. Please don't forget to subscribe to Africa Diaspora News Channel. And until next time, I love you all so much. Bye-bye. Is it hard to access affordable, healthy food? Then listen carefully. Daryl Addison, an African-American inventor, has patented a process for growing food on demand. He called it Torpedo Pot. Torpedo Pot is a fully automated flower pot that gives you control over your plant's environment. All you do is add soil, seeds, and plants to the flower pot and watch it grow. Yes, Torpedo Pot grows the rest. Visit www.torpedopot.com. Hello, everyone. Please make sure you subscribe to the African Diaspora News Channel app on these platforms.